I'm talking today about Popper and aesthetics. And the other thing is that, as I've mentioned while we were talking informally to some of the people, I have today had a COVID-19 booster injection and also a flu injection. And so if what I say is not particularly coherent, don't put it down to my incompetence, just put it down to the effects of the two vaccinations. And I suppose I should also say that uh, if you, you think that is convincing, I, pr I have got a number of interesting property speculations, which I'd like to try to inter interest you in after the lecture. Let me make a start. I've already in the previous lecture indicated Popper's reluctance to speak about issues of meta-ethics. One might, for reasons of symmetry, not expect him to have had much to say about aesthetics. However, I think that there is probably enough to, for me to give one lecture on the topic. But nevertheless, I think the parallel with Popper on meta-ethics is in some respects broadly correct. I found, for example, when I was working with him, it difficult to get him to say anything much about music, despite his own deep knowledge of and deep concern for it. But that might possibly have been in the face of his recognition of my own utter ignorance of the subject. As I've indicated in earlier lectures, Popper had a deep personal concern for music. When I worked with him, there was a grand piano in the main downstairs room in his house, as there had been one in the large apartment in which he grew up. On this piano, he would sometimes play, although I never heard him do so. Um, although Papa ran into a problem, which is that he was affected by a form of deafness which made him hear notes from different ears at different pitches. So his ability to enjoy music when he got older was severely limited. Popper's background, however, was very much a musical one. In the Vienna of his day, it was common for middle-class people to play and to appreciate classical music. From comments that may be found scattered through his work, it's clear that music meant a great deal to him personally. In addition, there's a lot of information about music in his intellectual autobiography, Unended Quest. His family on his mother's side had a strong musical background, and Popper indicates that at one point he obviously considered uh, whether he could have a career in music. In purely personal terms, it's striking that he was a member of two different musical organizations. On the one side, he became a member of the Society for Private Performances, which Schoenberg ran, as a result of a passing influence from Mahler. And he became a pupil of Schoenberg's student, Erwin Stein. Popper reports that he got to know some of Schoenberg's work well, and he also went to rehearsals of the work of Webern and of Berg. However, he didn't like this kind of music very much. The other organization was the School of Church Music, the Vienna Conservatorium. He was admitted to this on the basis of a fugue that he had himself written. And indeed, Popper composed a little right through his life, taking Bach as a model. I've heard something of this played, and one example is actually available on YouTube. Um, Henry Hardy, who is looking after the literary estate of uh, uh, Brian McGee, 
found a copy of this recording uh, amongst Brian McGee's uh, papers, and he has posted it to YouTube, and I've put on the uh, uh, overhead here a link, and this will go into the notes for the lecture. But Popper came to the conclusion that he wasn't good enough to be able to make a career as a musician. He liked some of Bruckner and Brahms, while he very much did not like Wagner, particularly for the words of the ring. And he especially didn't like Richard Strauss. Uh, he really disliked his music very much. There's actually a striking story about this in John Watkins' memoir of, about Popper that he wrote for the British Academy. He tells of the Poppers being invited to the opera at Glyndebourne by Lionel Robbins. And uh, this I should fill in, Glyndebourne uh, is an open air uh, opera. It's a uh, really a very posh occasion. I mean, people will dress up in formal uh, uh, dress for it and it's going there is taken really uh, very seriously. Uh, Popper was not a great one for dressing up, although he dressed up formally when he had to, and it created a huge fuss in the Popper household to get ready for this. Indeed, Watkins suggests in passing that the boiling of an egg in the Popper household was a major production, and so the uh, dressing up formally to go to such an occasion, you can well imagine. Popper was in the end formally dressed and everything then waited on the final touch. Namely, his stuffing his ears with cotton wool as he disliked Strauss's music so much that he simply didn't want to have to listen to it. But he felt that he couldn't decline so kind an invitation. There is though more to Popper and music than just this. On the one side, he chose the history of music as part of his PhD studies. And in this connection, he hoped to develop some ideas about how polyphonic music, counterpoint and Western harmony were developed over time. Popper conjectures that it may in its origin have been the result of mistakes made by a congregation when they had to make responses in a service. And what happened then, having been taken up by a musician who realized the possibilities that this kind of interplay allowed for. The situation is that in the end, the main melody places limitations on the subsidiary melody, which, however, should sound as if it stands independently as a piece of music. Popper says a bit more about all this in Unended Quest, but as he says there, it also had a significance which related to his more general intellectual development. This serves to draw attention to something that is significant in Popper's work, but which is, I think isn't as fully explained elsewhere. Namely, Popper's view was that it was the canonization of church melodies, which meant the imposition of dogmatic restrictions on them, which produced the so-called cantus firmus, against which counterpoint could develop. That's to say it produced a framework, order and regularities, which allowed for the possibility of innovative freedom without producing chaos. Once this kind of structure had been explored, it then became possible to replace the old cantus firmus with new melodies against which new counterpoints could be developed. Popper generalizes here and argues that it was dogmatism that provided a necessary framework for the exploration and creation of order generally. This then led him to the idea that there's a commonality between music and science, namely that musical and scientific creation require the use of dogma or myth as a man-made path of which we make use when exploring the world. 
Popper comments further, and I quote, a great work of music, like a great scientific theory, is a cosmos imposed on chaos, its tensions and harmonies inexhaustible even for its creator. There's also a similar remark along these latter lines in Popper's objective knowledge. Here he discusses in passing some work by his old friend, the art historian Ernst Gombrich on the autonomy of a work of art. And in this context, Popper, when discussing these ideas of Gombrich's, quotes Haydn, who, when listening to the first chorus of his work, The Creation, broke into tears and said, I haven't written this. And this isn't a matter of the orchestra not playing what he'd written. It's just that he discovered a kind of depth in the work, which he'd never imagined that it would have. To issues of this kind, I'll return shortly. First, however, I'll say something more about Popper's ideas about music. The first theme which I'll discuss here relates to some of Popper's ideas between, about a difference between Bach and Beethoven, which in some ways relate to or resonate with Popper's later ideas about World Three. To mark the difference, he made use of the terms objective and subjective. When introducing this, Popper says a little in criticism of the idea that art is self-expression. By parallel with his ideas about language, his complaint is that to call uh, something self-expression, say a work of art, can't usefully characterize art because self-expression is always present trivially. I'd like in this context to flag an issue which I hope to explore in more detail when I talk about Popper and education in the second series of these lectures with which I've been threatening you. It is that there seems to me a certain tension between what one might call the progressivist themes in education, which those writing about Popper and education have tended to take up from his work, and his own stress on world three, and on the way in which we need to form ourselves in relation to world three objects. It seems to me obvious enough that, as world three is the, is the product of the imagination of many different people and of critical exchanges about their products, that the idea that the child can be expected to invent these things for themselves is just, to put it bluntly, idiotic. I think there may be ways of handling the contrasts in Popper's work here, but I'll leave this to the second series. Next, Popper is critical of people aiming at originality. The task of the artist on Popper's view is the perfection of the work of art rather than trying to express their own personality. The artist should be concerned rather with the integrity of the work of art and should serve the integrity of the work of art. In this way, Popper says, he may grow as a person through interaction with what he does. But what of the contrast between two sorts of music? Bach, in Popper's view, forgets himself in his work, while at the same time impressing his personality onto it. Beethoven, by contrast, seemed to Popper to be, and I quote, conscious of expressing himself and even his moods. Popper stressed that he wasn't, in making this contrast, concerned with the difference between religious and secular music, or with the denial of the legitimacy of the emotional content or the emotional impact of music, where Popper also stresses the significance of the impact of the music upon its inventor. 
Popper goes on to say more about Bach's inventions. In these, music is to be learned from examples, but also by invention within a discipline. People can learn by trial and error, and through this process, their musical judgment and taste, uh, and also their creative imagination may grow. But all this will depend on effort, industry, dedication, sensitivity to the work of others, and also self-criticism. There will also be a constant give and take between the artist and his work, rather than simply the expression of his personality in his work. Popper, and this comes out strikingly in what he later writes about World Three, sees ourselves as being shaped in interaction with our products and not just our own ones, but other people's World Three products. Popper then offers some reflections on Plato's ideas about art. Plato sees art as an inspiration from the muses. First, the artist is possessed and communicates what he's being possessed by to his audience. His work then induces similar emotions on the part of his audience. And that one must also, for Plato, distinguish between mere craft or skill and divine inspiration. Popper suggests that we may see modern theories of art as expression as the product of reinterpreting this in such a way that there is self-inspiration by the artist. By contrast, Popper stresses but reinterprets the third of these points. That's to say that for him, the proper theory is one which sees the artist and the audience as being emotionally moved by the work of art itself. However, Popper also stresses that solving the problem of depicting emotions or of creating something that may make people feel particular emotions is only one small part of what may be involved in the arts. This he goes on to illustrate in terms of problems involved in architecture and in the writing of a fugue. What about progress in art? Popper is happy to acknowledge that there can be progress in the arts. New possibilities may be discovered, but these will typically bring with them new problems. There's also technological progress. Although Popper here is skeptical that there can be progress in the sense of a growth of musical knowledge, just because he thinks it unlikely that someone who innovates also has a complete command of the older techniques. There's also the risk that newly realized possibilities may kill off older ones. Popper here writes that, I quote, dynamic effects, dissonance, or even modulation may, if used too freely, dull our sensitivity to the less obvious effects of counterpoint. Popper's main critical ideas, however, were directed at what he's described as historicism in art. That's to say, of the image of the artist as being the unappreciated genius who not only expresses the spirit of his time, but is in fact ahead of his time, who is the leader of the avant-garde, something that is understood only by a few advanced connoisseurs. Popper saw this kind of attitude at close quarters in the Society for Private Performances. Summing up what he found there as, I, I quote, how can we remain ahead of everybody else and even constantly supersede ourselves? In Popper's view, well, there may be something important in having ambition, but in his view, the ambition to write a work which is ahead of its time has nothing to do with art. I've already indicated what his own preferred view was. He sums it up at the end of Unended Quest when reflecting on the relation between ourselves and World Three. As against an expressionist view for Popper, 
everything depends on give and take between ourselves and our products. These products become largely independent of their makers, and we can gain more knowledge from them than we ever imparted to them. In Popper's view, we can grow and become ourselves only in interaction with World 3, and may therefore take comfort from the fact that all of us may be able to make contributions to World 3. Some further themes. Popper was, as I've mentioned, a great friend of the art historian Ernst Gombrich. Gombrich was by no means simply someone who applied Popper's ideas. Uh, Gombrich's uh, book, it's uh, based on interviews called A Lifelong Interest, offers uh, a fascinating picture of Gombrich's other intellectual interests. But there are some points, for example, in Gombrich's Art and Illusion, where there are important commonalities between them. I should say there are other things as well, ideas about situational logic and a number of other points. The Gombrich's lifelong interest uh, comments on a, a few of these things where uh, there, there, is, there are commonalities with Popper. Popper himself, in commenting on Gombrich, endorses his stress on artists as involved in problem solving. There's a commonality there <laughs> with R.G. Collingwood as well. And also his ideas about the autonomy of a work of art. Popper also stresses the use of trial and error by artists, that's to say uh, of an artist tentatively putting a speck of paint on a canvas and then stepping back to appraise the effect. Next, art and science. In a short talk that Popper gave at the Salzburg Festival in 1979, the last thing on which I worked with him when I was his assistant, he stressed some parallels between art and science. Let me take you through some of these. First, he favored the idea of art for art's sake in the sense of the importance of the work of art and suggested that there was a parallel here with the pursuit of science by great scientists for the sake of knowledge rather than because of its possible applications. He sees both also as stemming from myth. What about divergence? What leads to differences? In Popper's view, it's the kind of criticism to which they're exposed. Here one can distinguish between aesthetic and literary interests and rational interests in the sense of an interest in what is true. The former on Popper's account, and I quote, evaluates the beauty of the language, the energy of the rhythm, the radiance and vividness of the images, the dramatic tension and its persuasive power. This, he suggests, leads to epic and dramatic poetry, to poetic song, and to classical music. He wishes to suggest, however, that in both fields, the creation of myths plays a continuing role. What of progress in science? As there is a name truth, one can assess progress towards this. In the arts, there are, on his account, a variety of aims in relation to these, for example, about mastering perspective, one can indeed talk about progress, but he stresses that there were other things at work, and also the great works of art may affect us independently of the artist's technical skills. There may also be progress and decline in the powers of the individual artist. Popper also stresses learning. In contrast to expressionism, he stresses how artists may learn from their mistakes, giving some examples even from the work of Mozart, while noting that Mozart, like he said about Bertrand Russell when Russell was writing philosophy, typically achieved perfection immediately, normally making very few, if any, corrections to their manuscripts, something which contrasts sharply with Popper, who was always fiddling around with and improving uh, any paper of his. 
By contrast, Popper stressed the way in which Beethoven constantly made corrections. Popper then stressed the significance of creative self-criticism in art and creativity as involving an interplay between imaginative intuition and criticism, discussing the way in which in Beethoven, and I quote, the beautiful choral fantasia grows into the still more beautiful ode to joy. All told, Popper stresses the interplay in both science and art between imagination and criticism. But above all, what I think lies at the heart of Popper's approach to aesthetic issues is his objectivism. That's to say of the arts as creating objects that stand independently of ourselves, upon which we can work, but from which we can also learn. Clearly, such creations may transform the experience of people who simply consume these products, but they may also give their creators an experience like that of Haydn, who felt that in hearing his own work, he was hearing something more than he had intentionally created. I would like in the concluding parts of this lecture to throw in a few more slightly wild ideas. I'd like to make two additional points of a rather different character. The first involves a look back at the previous lecture on Popper and Epics. Here, what I wish to say relates to objectivity. There is a sense in which Popper's approach to aesthetics is objectivist. Aesthetics is not for Popper just a matter of self-expression. It's a matter of problem solving and the creation of and of our being influenced by world three objects. All this is fine, but there are a couple of issues that one might raise about it. The first is that one might ask, if one takes the kind of view that Popper does, is there any reason why works of art shouldn't be intersubjective products? Popper favors a view in which the artists say might initially produce something and then step back think about it and correct it. He might decide, say, that there is a problem which was not properly resolved. But if one is critical of subjectivism and of notions of art as self-expression, is there any reason why the product should be just the product of one person? After all, we're familiar enough with, say, the production of advertising, as something that is produced by a team in which other people contribute to and correct and improve on someone's initial idea. But just what is the difference? Clearly one might say, well, in the case of advertising, just what the aim, goal or problem is, is more externally defined in terms, for example, of what will make the uh, biggest impact on the poor saps who are going to buy the product. But just why isn't this the case for a work of art, which after all is aiming at criteria which aren't just the subjective whims of the artist? I'm raising this question not because I have any particular opinion about it, but because it may be something that requires some thought and where if one wants to emphasize very strongly that um, the creation and improvement of works of art uh, shouldn't be something which is fully intersubjective, might this possibly lead us back to thinking further about Popper's anti-expressionist approach in his aesthetics. I say anti-expressionist approach. I mean, Popper tends to talk about uh, self-expression as being uh, uh, there, but trivially. But if you are an objectivist, just what is the role of the individual creator? I'm not here saying that Popper is wrong, but if he's right, how does one avoid what I've here suggested? Or should one actually wish to do so? As in the case uh, where I was suggesting last time, of uh, ethical claims, 
should they be open to intersubjective scrutiny rather than just the scrutiny of their originators? And is there a parallel here with regard to works of art? My second point in this area relates to the status of aesthetics and of ethics. My concern is this. Popper makes various remarks about the objectivity of our standards. The conventions aren't arbitrary, and he talks, as you well know, about world three. These points can be applied to aesthetics, but also to ethics. But all this leads me to ask several questions. First, on the face of it, we don't want to say that the status of ethics and of aesthetics is just the same. But just what do the differences between them consist of? Second, aesthetics on the face of it looks something that is more pluralistic than is ethics. That's to say, while there can be legitimate variety in ethics and uh, the acceptable variation is surely less. Well, we can also surely say, or am I uh, just a Philistine here, that when it really comes down to it, beauty doesn't matter in the kind of way that ethics does. I also suspect that if poetry didn't exist, I personally wouldn't miss it. And the same, I think, goes for opera. I just say there that, I mean, uh, Verdi's Requiem seems to me to be one of the greatest things uh, that's been created. Yet Verdi, rather than writing other works of that character, uh, wrote a whole lot of opera, uh, the uh, storylines of which uh, tend to be absolutely fatuous. And so I think bring down the creative achievement. This doesn't mean that there may not be objective standards in both areas. It's just that it's perfectly possible simply not to care about an entire genre at all. And I think not to be the worse for it. That's to say, one may perfectly well learn how to recognize, say in a case like mine, uh, uh, what is a, a good poem and why uh, it's better than a bad one, but still say, but I'm just not interested. And similarly, with regard to opera. A second issue, what about a critical rationalist aesthetics? I only know of, I think, three books about aesthetics written self-consciously from a critical rationalist perspective. There is Sheldon Richman's uh, critical study of Ernst Gombrich, there is a little known book by Agassi and Javi, and there is also a book on Popper and literary theory in the Crit Rat, Rat series, uh, which I, I, I have seen but haven't read. The first two books are interesting, but when looking at them, I felt a bit dissatisfied, as I tend to do with philosophical aesthetics as a whole. Why? And what, in my view, might a critical rationalist aesthetics actually best look like. I venture into this with great trepidation just because I am so much of a Philistine. But nonetheless, I'd like to say something, not least so that you can refute it in the discussion period. I would have thought that we should start with description of what there is to be experienced in different aesthetic objects and what the merits and otherwise are of different kinds of thing which are produced as such. That's to say that we should be discussing specific kinds of works of art and within those specific examples and in such a way as to bring out what there is to be enjoyed aesthetically about them. One could consider their strengths and weaknesses but also how to approach them. That's to say what one needs to know about the genre if one is not already familiar with it. Um, also how to gain the kind of familiarity which will bring out what is to be appreciated in the specific thing with which one is dealing. This would mean that such an aesthetics would at one level be a kind of guide to and critical commentary on different fields of, its, of artistic endeavor and would uh, 
give us guidance too in how to appreciate them. And it would serve also as a forum for the discussion of their strengths and weaknesses. And of the specific strengths and weaknesses, say, uh, in the case of music, of different performances. From this and its huge richness and diversity, to which one would add by way of critical commentary, which for those who could do it would involve not just words, but also the production of art and music by way of commentary. One would then move on to discussion of how what was involved in its appreciation related to other things. That's to say, the degree to which one needed to draw on specific natural or cultural expectations. To what extent, say, are the kinds of uh, uh, psychological and intellectual categories that we make use of when we are learning about factual material also being made use of in the creation and appreciation of the arts. And also, as to how what was there to be appreciated might be different depending on people's cultural or aesthetic backgrounds. I've been very struck in this context in, when I was in Australia um, by finding out a little bit about Aboriginal Australian art, where, where typically for the uh, Aboriginal artists involved, uh, what they were doing was uh, typically related uh, to what one might call the, the, uh, uh, the totems of uh, particular bands or clans or mobs uh, uh, that they were in. So that rather than this being something which uh, was purely aesthetic, uh, it had uh, other purposes behind it. But one might say similarly that if you look at the history of Western art, a great deal of the material was really the vehicle for particular religious concerns, such that depending on people's knowledge of these things, how the thing was understood and what was to be appreciated about it might differ. One might also ask how what started to be elaborated interrelated to our cognitive and other capacities. To consider issues such as that raised in passing by Popper as to the way in which familiarity with one genre may pose problems for our appreciation of another. I mean, I'm very conscious of this myself. I'm a musical philistine, but I tend to like uh, uh, orchestral work uh, from the uh, middle of the 19th century uh, into the early 20th century. But if one likes that, then it seems to me it is much more difficult to appreciate some earlier work uh, just because, as the quotation from Popper that I gave before indicated, certain of the kind of things that are going on in the early work, one just doesn't recognize, I think, unless one has a particular training in it, just on the grounds that the sort of expectations that you have about how music will go, uh, about how a dissonance may be handled and so on, will be very different depending on what one's musical background is. And there are also issues about what interrelations there may be between aesthetic experience and what serves to generate it in different areas of the arts. Such an approach I would have thought might be educative, not only interesting in itself, but also something that would help to educate us and to develop our aesthetic experience and thus our ability to get something important from different works of art. I also see this as being critical, not just say of the way in which a lot of material is presented in art galleries, in which it's typically just assumed that people will know how to appreciate what is being offered. Uh, I remember in this context uh, being taken to uh, around a, a small art gallery in Edinburgh by the chap that my wife was working for at the time. He was the art director of the Scottish Arts Council. And he talked to us a bit about a, a 
particular work of art, of, of a modern work of art. And he actually brought alive just how interesting it was and just what was to be appreciated in it. The problem is that if one just goes into the gallery, unless one is a specialist in uh, the kind of thing that he knew about, one simply wouldn't pick up on that. But it might also lead us to be critical of genre of the arts themselves. And that, however, would be another story. Although it's worth noting that Popper himself was critical of both Wagner and also of Richard Strauss, but only very briefly. And I'm just sorry if these latter ideas that I have were any good, I'm really sorry that Popper didn't spend a lot more time in the explicit discussion of the areas of music in which he was knowledgeable. Let me now call a halt and open this up to criticism. Any takers? Uh, Philip, you need to unmute. Okay, so thank you. Uh, and th th this is not a criticism uh, so much as a, a suggestion for further development. Um, and and that, that is that um, what you have said is very largely directed at um, music and art. And in other words, where there is um, a, a point, a, a material creation or an acoustic or, or visual creation. What, however, would you say about literary works or theatrical works? I mean, you, you briefly alluded to, to opera, but presumably the music rather than the lyrics. Um, what, what I'm interested in is, is um, there in literature and in theater, you have an attempt to capture a social context and presumably a logic of a social situation. Uh, you, you made very brief mention of that in passing and you, you made reference to uh, connections with Popper's criticism of historicism, but but it, it seems you you largely avoided literature um, in in your discussion, and it, it seems to me um, that he, he has a, a a couple of occasions alluded to, for example, Trollope um, and the writings of Trollope, which he uh, found particularly rich, um, and, and might be I, I don't know if there's been any systematic discussion of his um, his commentary on on Trollope. And there is that rather strange um, essay in, in the uh, Feshtre where um, he responds to um, Gombrich on the logic of Vanity Fair, if I remember correctly. And, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering um, specifically with regard to literary expression as opposed to other forms of art history, um, is there any uh, systematic work or do you have further comments because you, you did not really discuss those, you talked about music, etc. So. I talked about music really just because this is what Popper discusses. Um, I guess my own view would be that actually um, some the work of someone like C.S. Lewis would be very interesting for a critical rationalist to look at, particularly because he had an incredible knowledge of literature and its history. I mean, he was living at a time before electronic media were available and when um, there wasn't a great deal to distract him. And he apparently had a, a, a really remarkable knowledge of uh, he was able to retain a remarkable knowledge of what he read. And I think one has, with some of his discussions of aesthetic matters, um, a kind of anti-expressionism, but also uh, a sort of anti-modernism, but where aesthetic discussion is uh, uh, interrelated to a really detailed knowledge of literature. And I, I mean, I guess uh, 
though you you I mean a lot of this may be a matter of my just being a Philistine. Um, in many other respects, I'd see a certain kind of commonality, but it seems to me that one can, from a uh, Popperian perspective, uh, make really quite a case against modernism and what has come after it uh, as actually uh, moving away from uh, real achievement in uh, uh, literature and indeed various other things across the board. And uh, I, I would like to go back and uh, as I was suggesting in the uh, uh, Schirmer comments rather than the comments uh, paraphrasing what Popper had said, uh, to ground this stuff in a, uh, a detailed uh, knowledge of an interaction with uh, actual literature and other works. It, it seems to me, I mean, as I say, that, that he has alluded a couple of times to Anthony Trollope's work and his admiration for Trollope um, and the uh, capacity to put into literary form a, an understanding of the situation, the logic of the situation. That, that's one thing. But the, uh, the other thing that, that, that intrigues me is, is the extent to which Plato's work, uh, which is criticized on the plane of metaphysics and the criticized on the plane of, um, uh, of political and ethical theory, if you want to a better term, is also a work of, um, of art. And he, he treats it as such. He, he recognizes uh, that it has a structure, a literary structure. He also deals with uh, pre-Socratic poetry and, and um, the references that you have to some of the pre-Socratics, including uh, Xenophanes, for example, um, the, the, that the, some of the magnificent poems of uh, Parmenides. Um, th those, those he treats simultaneously um, as part of his engagement with the metaphysics, but also uh, he, he is appreciative of, of its aesthetics. And I'm, I, I'm not skilled in uh, you know, working through the, the, the aesthetic criticism or the aesthetic treatment, but I wonder if there has been, to your knowledge, any, any other person who has that, those, that skill set? Not that. as far as I know. Um, I mean, there, there, there are a couple of things here. I mean, there is this book in the Crit Rat series on Popper and literary theory, but from the very cursory uh, glance that I had just of the, I mean, I haven't bought it, and so um, haven't even been able to, to go into any, uh, to, to look in any detail at what's in the different sections, but it, it looked to me as if he wasn't uh, following Popper's discussion uh, of particular things in the kind of way in which you're suggesting. And I also simply don't know um, uh, how much the chap himself knows about Popper's work. So, uh, but that certainly is there. Um, the, uh, the Trollope material, I mean, he enjoyed Trollope. My recollection is that he didn't say a great deal about, about it. And, I mean, as I've indicated, I, I had a, a certain frustration in, in interactions with him because I would have loved it if he had, say, talked about his experience in Vienna. I mean, he, he, uh, there was a fleeting influence from Mahler, which he, but I, I would have been very, very interested if he talked a bit about what he, what he and other people were making of Mahler, what they liked and, and so on. But I mean, basically my job in working with him was to work with him, not to chat with him about a, a, a variety of, of other issues. And so uh, we really just had to get on with it. I mean, Popper's, uh, uh, Popper drove himself pretty hard, but uh, it also meant that his assistants had, had to keep their noses very much to the grindstone. And also, clearly, I mean, if he talked with me at all about this, um, 
he would have discovered so quickly that my knowledge was so poor that uh, he, he might have thought, well, look, this isn't really a conversation that it makes much sense to have. But I think that there is also this kind of element to it, a little bit like on stuff to do with ethics, where he was rather reluctant to engage in kind of high level discourse about aesthetic or moral matters. Um, whereas my feeling is no, actually this is really what's needed, but particularly by people who do know, who do know what they're talking about from which I might then say, be able to learn. One last question, if yeah, I may. You um, we, 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 I, you're in the, after the open set, you include his, uh, uh, correspondence, I think, about uh, Salman Rushdie's, uh, the, the persecution of Salman Rushdie and the death sentence against him. Do you happen to know whether he ever read any of Rushdie's work, for example, his Booker Prize winning work and things of that nature? I don't know at all. No, I think that the, uh, I, I think that that discussion was um, provoked purely by his being asked by the Society of Authors to um, join in an identification with uh, Rushdie as the author of this stuff. And I think, and I'm going to uh, have a go uh, in the second series about um, on, on something about Popper and toleration in which I'm going to discuss this because I think that there is a certain kind of uh, parallel also to Popper's um, comments about anti-Semitism in the open society. That's to say something which contrasts very strongly with contemporary ideas where uh, basic, where essentially people feel that on the strength of strongly felt intuitions about rights, they should be denouncing things. Popper kind of sees a lot of these things more in terms of saying, well, this is a difficult problem. What we need to do is, is, is almost to see how we can work together to avoid people being harmed. Okay, John. Yes, thank you, yep. Uh, just uh, one a very easy and quick question, one a little bit longer. <laughs> we uh, shall see. <laughs> uh, just a very, very quick, easy question was, because uh, you uh, talk about modernism, whether or not uh, Popper ever came to uh, learn to appreciate uh, jazz or rock music at all, or whether know it was, he was he was only only interested in classical music. His his interest was in classical music. I think what I don't know is um, at what point his uh, he was getting problems with his hearing which interfered with his appreciation of um, music of all kinds. I mean, if you imagine the experience of listening to music, we're actually hearing stuff at a different pitch. Mm -hmm. I mean, that must make it difficult. I don't know of his having uh, knowledge of either of those areas. I mean, uh, rock music, uh, you're talking about something which is uh, where, where he may well be the wrong generation for that. Um, he lived till 1994, so yeah, I mean, but but you but but you need to bear in mind how old he was. Yeah. And um, no, I don't know anything. It's conceivable that there may be material in his correspondence about these things. I don't know, for example, if Brian McGee talked with him about any of this stuff. I mentioned McGee just because um, McGee was very interested in Popper's work, but also was a dedicated Wagnerian. And uh, one could well imagine that, th that there might be stuff there. Um, although what I would say about it is the, um, there are initially in, Popper's correspondence, some interesting exchanges between uh, McGee and Popper. I think after that, it may well have been done largely um, on the telephone. And so we may just not have 
uh, the, the best of that material. However, there is a chap called Henry Hardy who is currently working on um, uh, uh, McGee's uh, literary remains, as it were. Um, I'd said to him, I, I, I had approached him before and said that uh, some of the exchanges between Popper and Mc, initial exchanges between Popper and McGee on politics mm -hmm. uh, would be well worth uh, uh, publishing. And it's conceivable that he might find something there. I mean, I've actually been in touch with him, although in an odd way, I, I actually confused him with someone else um, and uh, wrote to him um, about Popper's book, uh, projected book, Physics and Philosophy, thinking that he had worked for the academic side of the Clarendon Press. And I, I had just simply confused him with a couple of other people that Popper had been dealing with there. But I can on this actually write to him and ask if he's come across anything. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting, yeah. Sure. Um, the rushy thing I'll wait for when you, when you get into it, uh, as we saw last time, you and I have very different views on that. Uh, the other question I was gonna ask is, because it's something we dis I discussed with um, uh, Marguerite, a bit of a different discussion, is the question as to whether uh, world three objects are either um, invented or discovered to a certain extent. You know, this example with Haydn having sort of felt like his music might have come from somewhere else. Yeah? Okay. And, I, yeah. Yes, I can comment discovered, on that. Discovered or, 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 discovered or, or, or invented well. world three objects. What I'd say is that the primary account in Popper seems to me to be that uh, there is some human initiative and this then has typically unintended consequences and discoveries are then made within that. Uh, there are um, tensions because uh, I believe I'm right in saying that uh, I've either heard Popper uh, say, uh, talk, talk about uh, the number as an invention. I've had other, I've heard someone at one point trying to press him on uh, whether actually uh, uh, this is something which was always there to be discovered. And my feeling is that it's an issue that he just didn't really want to address. So um, while one may find in that area uh, things that were said, uh, it seemed to me that, that he, he didn't have a clear cut opinion about that, but that more typically, as in, as in the Haydn case, mm -hmm. the notion was that uh, by objectifying something, one could then find that there were further features and they may actually go beyond what one had intended to what one had done. Or as in the case of my lectures, you may objectify them and then find when you're delivering them that there's rather less there than you've, you've initially been hoping for. <laughs> okay, thank you. So it, it remains a question uh, whether to discuss Well, I, I think it's, I mean, even if one can quote Popper in a particular point, and I think I've come across something in language and the body mind problem, but I may have missed uh, uh, where he's expressed a specific opinion about this. My he recollection did, is that- He did talk it, about ethical discoveries as well. You know, sort of use the word discovery sometimes. Yes, but, but you see, this gets back to the issue that I was trying to press in terms of the stuff about ethics and the parallel between ethics and aesthetics. I mean, you can do this in a number of ways. I mean, one thing that you might say is, well, is there a difference between the status of ethics and aesthetics? On the face of it, one might say that there is a kind of relativity of aesthetics to us. But equally, I mean, something, an, an idea that I've often played around with, um, would really be to say the following. Suppose that we were vampires. 
What would a vampire ethics look like? Because there's a sense in which if you've got a form of life that depends essentially on uh, a certain kind of predation on uh, other things that mm -hmm. in all other mm -hmm. respects are like it, you'd think that its ethics might look a little bit different. Now, you can always say, well, there are these different systems of ethics which are all objective, but which are instantiated with different forms of life. But all I'm saying is that on the face of it, you could well imagine that if intelligent creatures are found elsewhere, I mean, you know, uh, in other galaxies, which in the end can be reached, um, there's no reason, as far as I can see, to suppose that their aesthetics need be anything like ours. Um, and so, so there are these kinds of issues, but then there's the issue with regard to ethics, that we tend to think of ethics as actually mattering rather than just being a matter of convention and taste. But okay, if one wants to take that view, how do you make sense of that? And th these, I think, are just issues that are opened up. Um, but I, I would see them as being issues for um, not for easy answers, but for further exploration. Okay. Thank you. Margareta. Um, it's, I don't really have a question. It's, it's more like a, <laughs> a comment. Uh, and I, I see where it goes as when you uh, when I hear you compare ethics and aesthetics, uh, I kind of hear you emphasize the judgments uh, that come with art, and and then I start thinking so and and when you say judgment, then of course, uh, and I'm a broken record, I know it, but Pop talks about that he discovers there is more than life than just being judgmental and and that leads him to uh, arguing in favor of uh, criticism uh, just argumentative uh, criticism but but part of 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 being able to criticize is that you need to be able to step back and, and come up then with being creative and come up with yes so, so I kind of see uh, uh, with alternatives, you have to invent them or um, and you have to be really creative. So um, so I was wondering if you uh, explored this issue of uh, judgment um, and maybe you addressed it during your slides, but I do, does that the thing about art, it, it forces us to really think about um, our art appreciation is we, we're sometimes making judgments and that the whole point of art is maybe to make ourselves aware of um, our judgmental processes. Uh, well, three, three different things. I mean, first yeah. of all, um, in terms of judgment, uh, it isn't enough just to say, uh, you obviously like that, I don't. I mean, what, what one is after is uh, for people to move on to engage in criticism and discussion of what they take the uh, features of these things to be. Um, I mean, let me give you, uh, uh, just by way of illustration, a, a couple of examples. Um, in uh, Mahler's first symphony, there is material that sounds remarkably like the uh, uh, nursery rhyme, uh, ding dong bell pusses in the well. Um, now, an, an interesting question might be, is that a problem just for uh, English speaking people who were brought up on that and so that the piece of music is then ruined in a way that is comparable to the manner in which uh, um, 
say, a, a number of pieces of classical music have been ruined by being used as the basis for popular hymns, um, where, I, I mean, it just is, has a, a, a devastating, or uh, does this have any kind of prehistory to it? And another comparable thing is that I, I remember talking with a, a friend of ours who was the uh, director of the Scottish Gallery of Modern Art. And we were talking about a, um, uh, a kind of outside exhibition which involved two large poles. And I said, well, the, the problem about that is that it looks very much like goalposts for a soccer match. And this, again, is, I think, a, 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 an issue and where in that case, I would have thought that the artist should have been culpable for uh, not actually bearing in mind that uh, the stuff would be kind of taken away. I mean, it's a bit like, um, you know, Fritz Saxel's work on symbolic images. I mean, it includes this, this fascinating, he's got several studies on this, including the fascinating one of how a particular idea or emotion becomes represented in a, a standard way that then comes to take over that particular area. And I'm putting my hands up here because um, angels, for example, were depicted in a particular kind of way so that uh, after that, uh, everyone either had to do it or people would be asking, well, if, he, if that was supposed to be an angel, why wasn't it done with kind of wings like that? So you've got these issues uh, uh, to be, I, I mean, played with and negotiated and so on. The, the other reason why I was uh, uh, paying attention to the parallel is this. When one reads what Popper says about the objectivity of ethics, he tends to talk about uh, conventions not necessarily being arbitrary, and effectively uh, the third world status of these things and so on. And what I was wanting to do here was to say, well, most of those things would equally seem to be true with regard to aesthetic judgments and, or, or works of art. So is Popper's account of objectivity the same in the two areas? And if that is the case, is there a problem about it? Just because I think we would probably be more inclined to say that there is in some sense more objectivity to ethics than there is to aesthetics. But if we want to say this, in what does it inhere? And that was the, that, that, that was the question that I was trying to raise and certainly not to answer. All right, so as, as a, a, another comment, uh, so by making that com comparison, you, you, you found a way to kind of connect it with the philosophy. But then um, the other angle is uh, that people uh, talk about art as really it's all about emotions that are being expressed. And then uh, the reason so first it's all about the evolution in art appreciation this the, the uh, people started thinking about art as being more connected with emotions so that was maybe not in the beginning uh, but uh, like 500 years ago but but more recently and so popper as i understand him he he, he didn't ne he never really talked about emotions uh, are i correct or or did you uh, find a couple of passages in which he was explicit about trying to address the role of emotions. Well, I yeah. would take it that his view is that um, it's not a matter of expressing emotions, but to the degree to which uh, art is concerned with these, it's a matter of the creation of things which will then elicit a particular emotion. Although on my understanding, Popper's view is, well, that is perhaps a, uh, a bit of uh, uh, 
uh, what's involved in the arts, but uh, it's in no sense the whole of it. Mm -hmm. So, but that the, it was maybe one of those unintended consequences. Uh, just that the artworks could evoke extreme emotions, and and that for that reason, one had to. I mean, in the case of Salman Rushdie, uh, as an example. Um, well, I think I. I mean, this may be. Uh, yeah. A, 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 uh, trespassing into areas that I shouldn't go for uh, at the risk of um, uh, upsetting John or provoking him to start a discussion which very kindly he's putting off to the next series. But it seems to me that there are, I mean, there are ways in which one can elicit particular kinds of emotions which are uh, cheap, and which also are uh, uh, something which I think can be problematic. So mm -hmm. that, um, I mean, th th let me give an example. Uh, if uh, in some area where there is tension between the Catholics and the Protestants, if some uh, Protestant hooligans uh, rush up to a, a pub where a, a lot of Catholics are drinking and open the door slightly and yell out some very derogatory comments about the Pope, uh, they are likely to expect, or they should certainly expect, that this will elicit uh, certain emotional reactions and probably uh, involve them in a certain amount of physical violence if the people can catch up with them. And the notion is, in a sense, that, uh, I mean, if you have, as part of what you're trying to do, the eliciting of particular sorts of emotions, that becomes, you know, an interesting technical problem. But there are also ways in which one can do this kind of stuff on the cheap, and there are also ways in which if what you're doing is creating a public, a, a, a work that's directed at the public generally, then on the face of it, I think you, you need to bear in mind what other people's legitimate sensibilities are and to moderate what you're doing in the light of that. I've got uh, John and Philip. Um, well, I did want to leave it to last next time, but since it's come up again. Well, <laughs> all I, I say is I, 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 I spoke I, I don't, only in a very limited way about this stuff. Yeah, yeah sure. I'm also yeah. going to respond in a limited way. I think uh, Rushdie was doing a lot more than, than simply just making a cheeky joke. He was intentionally satirizing a certain kind of orthodoxy. Um, in the way that Monte Python did with Life of Brian, et cetera, and all kinds of other uh, forms of satire. So it was a satirical, uh, it, was a, it was a form of satire that he was, he was involved in that, um, I mean, obviously was been, has been accepted in the West uh, to a certain extent by some time. And he was doing it uh, with, uh, with regard to the religion that he had grown up with. And, um, the, 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 the violence, the violence uh, uh, that it provokes is, is, is committed by those who commit the violence and not by the person who's writing the novel. I would have but, to say. but there are two kinds of problems about this. I mean, one is that um, we're now living in an age when everything becomes spread everywhere. So uh, if you're writing for a particular audience, you, you need also to bear in mind that it will come to the attention of other audiences. Um, another kind of issue that came up was, you may remember the um, controversy about the Danish cartoons exactly. of Muhammad. Now, one thing that was quite striking about this is really that 
a, uh, a Muslim leader in Denmark said, well, surely you wouldn't behave in this kind of way towards, uh, say, your own royal family. To which the Danes replied, but, but you obviously don't we would. really know very much about Denmark <laughs> because this kind of, con but, but the difficulty there is really that what something might mean in and how it's understood in one context may be very different in another. And I think that this actually poses some, some real issues about things. Um, I mean, but, but, but speaking of context, you do know that 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 uh, uh, the reason why there was such an uproar in, in North Africa and in Egypt and all these other places was because um, it was a, a campaign was launched yes, by yes, by yes, political yes. actors in those countries, and they yes. even added added uh, you know uh, yeah, the caricature yeah, of sorry. Muhammad as a pig that, that didn't exist I, in order for political reasons within those countries. Yeah. Look, I am well aware of that, mm -hmm. but that doesn't affect the point that I'm making, which is mm -hmm. just that in um, different cultural contexts, different things are treated and understood sure. in different sure. ways. And I think that this just does pose a, a, a genuine problem uh, about quite what is to be done. But I will, as I've threatened, attempt to address this I suspect, John, in ways that you won't like at all uh, in the lecture about toleration in, in, the, in the other series. But I think that, I mean, the very sorts of things that you were alluding to there are ones which really have to be discussed, but in, in, in some detail. So that's why I'd like to be able to do a, 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 a more detailed presentation on that before we take this particular one further. Okay. I just last last word of that I, I I've been discussing the Danish cartoons and and reading Salman Rushdie with Muslim students of mine for years and thus far I have neither been stabbed nor blown up nor shot so it's possible okay I've got now Philip and then Luke a uh, very quick very quick um point uh the connection on on uh, aesthetics and and ethics it, it seems to me that uh Papa um, believed that that um, we uh, can recognize suffering in others very very rapidly. That that um, if we live proximate to others, uh, we see if they're unemployed, if they're starving, if they're um, in other ways uh, hurting from from the organization, society, or or policies. Um, and he then later on comments on the increasing development of what he calls an abstract society, a society in which we are cut off from our fellow uh, persons that we, we uh, travel encased in cars or, or um, uh, we, we have a purely electronic uh, forms of uh, communication. He suggests even perhaps uh, sex is replaced by artificial insemination in, in some uh, possible future. Um, within that, all that remains is, is a possible uh, use of uh, various forms of art, almost as delivery mechanisms for sympathy and and I'm, I'm wondering there whether there is connection in his discussion of the increasing abstract society whether there is a connection you you, you mentioned that that uh, it's not he is opposed to, the, to seeing art as an expression of emotion but certainly recognizes that it might be a reception or an impression of emotions or, or conceivably of suffering etc are you aware of in his reflections on the so-called abstract society, which he introduces in his work after 1950, um, is he there also connecting that with the various, for want of a better term, aesthetic technologies? I hate to use that term, but but uh, you know, novels that are mass-produced or, or novellas or, or TV series that might enable us to connect with depictions of someone else's life, including someone else's suffering? The short answer is, I don't think that Popper had significant personal experience of these things. It's certainly the case that he 
wrote a piece. In fact, just he was working on it up until the very last days, this thing on television and violence and concerns about desensitization of people in that context. Um, but I think there are two elements to it. I mean, first of all, Popo was typically just uh, working away at a variety of problems and issues in the sciences and in areas in philosophy and wasn't really a cultural commentator. And also, I think, tended uh, uh, not very much to like to talk about uh, kind of the, the sort of stuff that obviously interests both of us. Um, I'd also say that there is a certain problem because Popper has this notion of the um, abstract society, and he also then makes use in um, certainly from the mid 1950s onwards of this notion of a fatherless society, one in which uh, uh, one might almost say natural authority or what's experienced as such has been undermined. He doesn't really, I mean, he invokes this, but he doesn't really offer a social theory about these things to explain what gives rise to this, what the limitations uh, might be on this in respect of these matters. And so I think that all one can do is just to, if one's concerned about these things, to uh, strike out on one's own. And I mean, my feeling for what it's worth is that we are exposed now by way of television and social media to all kinds of things that make a really striking impression on us. And I mean, you can hardly go in Britain, at least, any time watching television without almost endless uh, adverts concerning the sufferings of small children and cute looking animals and so on being offered to you by charities or, or trying to get money out of you. Um, and I think more generally, the form, I think particularly influenced by social media, which then feeds back into newspapers, it is very striking. I mean, I, I subscribe in Britain to the Times, and I get this online, and uh, you have catchy headlines and a picture, and then typically a relatively short discussion. And while these things aren't quite as bad as the traditional tabloids, most of them are um, attempting really to stir up a particular emotional reaction to things. And I think the result of this is pretty awful because, um, I mean, clearly quite often bad things happen which no one intended to happen, where no one in a sense, and, and where it couldn't have been anticipated what would happen, where no one in is culpable for these things happening, but at every turn, it's as if who is to blame? And, and where I think in a way, we're, we're in danger of being corrupted by this because we start to forget that social institutions typically come with pros and cons, and that you can certainly talk about reforming social institutions or replacing certain of these things by other ones, but anything you suggest is likely also to have things that you don't want coming as part of the package. And if people move to a situation where the occurrence of anything that gets them excited and worked up is bad, uh, then 
you're going to get to a setting where where nothing is acceptable. I, I, th I think your, your, your experience may not be typical of what we now have in America, which is, I mean, we, you, Britain has a, a dominant couple of broadcasters, for example, and people, at least of your age, uh, are likely to watch them rather than depend on um, a more fractured or fragmented media. What, what, I, what I find in my uh, younger students is that they don't watch TV, they get, uh, they are, or if they do, it, it's very much a specific set of cable channels which are not necessarily shared with many others, which are highly specialized in terms of viewpoint and in terms of what is screened and selected. Likewise with social media. I am amazed how uh, some students, a mere fair five years after, let's say, major uh, refugee crises uh, uh, affecting Europe uh, from, from the Middle East, um, were unaware of some of those uh, crises. I was, I was amazed last year to find that there had been no stories in, in my students' repertoire uh, concerning the Rohingya, even though that is a much more recent crisis. So um, it, 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 um, it seems to me a particular problem that, that the technologies have becoming ever more siloed and, uh, and our range of sympathy is, as a consequence, contained within um, selected, um, like-minded and like-selected by, by those who, who um, select them for us according to the various uh, algorithms used by the social media. People. I think that that's um, dead right. And there are two kinds of problems. I mean, either, I, I mean, people are, as it were, naturally attracted to stuff that confirms their prejudices. And the social media typically are concerned, and I guess this is now spreading to other online media, basically to get you to click onto things which hold your attention for as long as possible so they can flog that to advertisers. But this is about as unpoparian as you, you, you can get, because what you really want is to get people reading stuff which is constructed by people with views different from their own and where if they then get rattled by something doing comparisons across different sites to see um, how this is being treated but if you simply allow your prejudices to be stoked by uh, material where uh, the underlying motivation of which is to get you as worked up as possible in one way or another. This is really uh, not much of a basis for politics. I'll take my, my lead. Okay, Luke. You're muted. muted. I just want to add something um, because Popper said that we should uh, use our freedom responsibly. And that's what I... But I, if I remember correctly from the uh, Salman Rushdie problem there, Salman Rushdie had apologized. And I think that's why Popper thought that he had so, done something that was uh, maybe, well, let's let's compare it like Ayan Hirsi Ali. You remember that, guy mistake, in, I think. that guy in Germany, which was a mistake. He said later that he should not have apologized. Uh, I read a book from him. I never read uh, the Satanic Forces. But I read a book from him on the subject, and he wrote later that that was a big mistake of him to apologize. But that might have given uh, Popper the uh, impression that he had a reason to apologize. Eh? So uh, I think that's the story, part well, of the story look, about. I, it. I'm sorry. I'm what I'm going to have to say on this is this is a topic on which I'm going to be giving okay. a lecture next time, and where there is, I think, quite a a lot to the issues. I mean, you're raising things that are perfectly yes, yes, yes. Uh, that are perfectly reasonable. Um, I'm. I think I am here uh, all the way with Popper and beyond on these things, but for reasons which I will endeavour to explain <laughs> next time, and then take yes. the appropriate punishment. Okay. Oh. <laughs> that no, well, that, that's, a, that, that, that's the point of having discussion <laughs> yes, of these yes. things because I, I mean otherwise uh, if you just have a lecture and then you push the button and then that's it um, 
there is not the opportunity to learn. There's not the opportunity to see where, where people think that what you're saying is weak and so on. Can I just ask, do we have any other questions now or do we call this one a day? Okay then, well, thank you all very much. There is one more of these to go, which is on Popper the person. And where I'm just going to speak about just what he was like and what what working for him was uh, was like, and uh, I, I'm happy to share that and to take any questions uh, 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 from you on that. And then uh, you'll have uh, um, a while, namely until next May, uh, uh, to think. Uh, do I actually want to hear more from Jeremy on these things? But when I put round the notes after that one, I will put round a tentative list of the sort of things that I'm planning to talk about. So I'll be very open to people coming back to me and saying, oh, no, 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 you're not going to talk. Or alternatively, why don't you talk about this? And I'll do what I can, constrained only by my own competence and where i indicated in in these this particular last talk uh, it's very much on the margins of my competence um i think that uh, i i will um because i've been asked to do it attempt to say something about uh popper science and realism uh, but that will be uh, uh, stretching the bounds of my technical competence very considerably. But at any rate, thank you all very much. And I'll see you, you references and so on uh, on Monday or Tuesday. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.